you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. You guys are the smartest audience in the world. It really is. I mean, if you've listened to every show or most of the shows on the Chris Voss Show, especially those in recent memory of the last, uh, I don't know, four or five years we've been doing great, brilliant authors and minds, uh, you have learned some amazing stuff. And it, if, it, if, it, if it has not made you smarter, go back and listen to all the shows again. And give us a, a five-star review on iTunes. Today we're going to be talking about uh, behavioral maladies. We're going to be talking about Hitler and monsters and all that good stuff. And uh, some of the psychology that goes into uh, why these people became the monsters they are. I posted about this uh, author and his book uh, a few weeks ago when it first came to me. The press copy came out. And people were innately and extremely excited and interested in this. You know... I, Every day, sometimes in the news, we see monsters, we see horrific events, we see people that probably were maybe at one time deemed good, well-meaning people, people that you would never suspect. You know, you just hear that from the neighbors of these folks. They go, they seem like nice people. You would never think that they would do this. And somehow people take different turns in their lives that ends up building some incredible monsters that do destructive and horrific things to us today. And even though we talk about history and sometimes it seems a long time ago, we see these monsters in everyday life. Yesterday there was a shooting at a bank. Uh, people lost their lives over the, uh, the monstrosity of someone who made some poor choices or maybe had some maladies. Uh, there's uh, a war going on right now between Russia and the Ukraine where one man, uh, Putin, has determined that uh, he will affect the the uh, the alignment of world events and the horror and atrocities that will be dealt on other human beings in, in great sadness. So I'm always interested to have these authors that talk about history so that we can learn about history and maybe we can prevent these things from happening in the future. Uh, today, we have an amazing guest on the show. He is the author of the newest book to come out February 28th, 2023, Hitler's Maladies and Their Impact on World War II, a behavioral neurologic, neurologist, neurologist, am I saying that right, Tom? Neurologist. Neurologist. Hey, he's going to diagnose me after the show and he's <laughs> blot at me, clearly. Hitler's Maladies <laughs> and Their Impact on World War II, a behavioral, neuro, a behavioral neurologist view. Uh, Tom Hutton, PhD and MD, I believe both is on yes. the show with us today. Yes. There you go. Uh, he's going to be a brilliant mind, and one of them is not me on the show. So that's why we asked for the guests to come on the show, so that we can make everyone smarter, and uh, certainly they don't want to be listening to me. Uh, anyway, getting into details on him, he is an internationally recognized clinical and research neurologist and educator, the past president of the Texas Neurological, Neurological Society. Uh, you know, I'm having some deviations of my neurology here, Tom. Uh, he has served as professor and vice chairman of the Department of Medical and Surgical Neurology at the Texas Tech School of Medicine. He now lives on his cattle ranch near Fredericksburg, Texas. Welcome to the show. Dr. Hutton, how are you? I'm fine, Chris, and thank you so much for asking me to come on your show. This is a great honor for me. It's an honor to have you as well. We love great minds on the show because, as I mentioned before, I am not one of them. Probably mostly deserving, as you'll probably find on the show, of a lobotomy. Uh, so give us your .com so people can find <laughs> you on the interwebs. Please. People can find me at TomHuttonMD.com. There you go. And he will be having me committed after the show, I'm sure. Uh, so, Tom, what motivated you want to write this book? I've been interested in Adolf Hitler for 25 years. I suppose all of us growing up in our generation uh, have been to a degree. But I learned about his Parkinson's disease fairly early on. Mm. That was my area of special interest and expertise. We were doing work in behavioral aspects of Parkinson's disease. And after a certain period of time, 
we learned our patients developed a certain neuropsychological change in their thinking and we tracked Hitler's timing for his Parkinson's, we assumed that he must have had this malady. Mm. And sure enough, we began looking into the, the historical information that was available, and his colleagues were talking about this. So that's how I got interested initially was through his Parkinson's disease. Um, my book that came out in 2016, Carrying the Black Bag and Neurologist's Bedside Tales, had a chapter on Adolf Hitler, particularly how his Parkinson's disease and this behavior affected uh, the Battle of Normandy. Hmm. Following the, the book, it was well received. My editor and others asked me if I could expand it into a full book and include his other ailments, such as his heart disease and his gastrointestinal his drug usage and other more minor diseases. Yeah. That's what really got me going. There you go. There you go. So you, in the book, you, you pretty much cover his whole life. You cover his youth, uh, where you start out the book, the early years, his adolescent behavior and his health. Uh, let's kind of chronicalize from beginning to end. Uh, what, what, uh, tell us where, where his beginnings were and, and where did the cracks start? I think they started very early. He had uh, a very challenging relationship with his father, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, his father was alcoholic, abusive, extremely stubborn, and physically beat Adolf and his half-brother, Alois Jr., frequently, wow. and probably beat uh, Adolf's mother as well, Clara. Mm -hmm. uh, he loved his mother. Clara was a very warm, sensitive, loving person. He said in Mein Kampf, he honored his father, respected his father, but he really hated the man because of the abuse that was heaped upon him. His father would also humiliate him uh, on a daily basis, and uh, there was a very bad relationship within the household. It must have been extremely tense with the mother trying to protect him and his father being abusive toward him. A lot of tension in the house. That probably was where his behavior began to change. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, you know, we've had a lot of people on the show that have talked about childhood traumas and the effect they've had. And it, it, it's really interesting to me, and I'm, I'm no psychologist, but it, it seems like a lot of, a lot of things happen in childhood that can, that can create some crazy paths in your life. Absolutely. Uh, in, the, in the book, I tried to go into what has been written uh, by various psychologists, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts. They all have their take on it. And probably a constellation of findings come together and explain why he became so affected and became so grandiose, so narcissistic, even as a youth. Uh, all of these characteristics even increased as he got older. Did he have a narcissistic father, per se? Was there any diagnosis of that? I haven't seen anyone describe his father as as that, but mm -hmm. certainly there's a good likelihood that his father was quite narcissistic, along with his extreme stubbornness and abusive behavior. Seen that movie. Um, the, <laughs> uh, the, the uh, you know, it, it, uh, narcissism kind of gets kicked around. I, I do want to say, you know, uh, there's narcissistic tendencies is, and, and sometimes someone isn't a full blown narcissist, right? They just might have the tendencies of it. Is that true? Yes. I, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's interesting how we mirror, uh, you know, I, when I grew up, there were things that I didn't like about my father. And I said, you know, I, I had kind of a, do as don't do as he did. But in the end, there were a lot of things that I adopted without even realizing it. And a lot of his traits that I didn't like, and I didn't learn till they exhibited themselves sometimes with my own children, uh, which were my dogs, um, that I, I was handling things, uh, in the same way he was and not healthy. Uh, and so it's interesting to me how, you know, sometimes, especially, you know, I, I don't know what a, mother-daughter relationship is i've never been through that experience clearly uh but a father-son relationship is a very interesting relationship and in, in how you know I, I think books have been written probably psychological papers have been written in 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 that whole relationship between a father and son and the dynamic that goes through the span of our lives 
Yes, I, I think what you were saying about the relationship with your father was also true of Adolf and his father, Alois Sr. Yeah. Uh, they, um, uh, just like oil and water, they, mm. they just didn't mix. Yeah, there's it's it, and I think a large part of it is, and I think this is just obvious to everybody. I mean, you spend you you spend so much of your time around your parents, and so you mirror who they are, and you develop who they are. Even though you're like, I don't want to be like dad doing this. He he seems like he's not the best at it, but you know that's who we become. We seek our relationships that do that. So, what what are the first cracks that you start to see with him? I mean, certainly growing up in an alcoholic environment, an abusive environment as a child, you're always trying to figure out why does someone love me. It really puts you on the ropes of a boxing ring, and you can't. You know, you're not equipped usually to understand. Well, you know, dad has a problem and and this sort of thing, um, uh, you know, where does he go from there? I think it can be seen in his schoolwork. He did yeah. okay in elementary school, but shortly thereafter, he had began having troubles. He was obviously bright, but he didn't apply himself, had to repeat several grades. Finally, when he got to high school, real school, uh, he dropped out that last year, and so yeah. he didn't even have a high school education. And that was really because he was not getting along well with his teachers. He was uh, doing pranks. He was very unpopular. He was a loner. Uh, didn't have many friends at all. One one friend really stood out. Uh, but um, so he was having more and more problems in school, which is usually where the behavior starts. And, of course, he didn't finish even his high school before he took off to Vienna, where he wanted to become a visual artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, so was he, he wanted to become a visual artist. That's kind of interesting because usually that's a very emotional thing to go after. It's not a very masculine logic and rational thing. It's kind of interesting that he would go after that. It, it is. It is. Uh, he always wanted to be an artist, and that was one of the major topics he and his father fought over. His father mm. wanted him to be a something like he, a customs officer, some sort of a official. Uh, but Adolf just couldn't see that. He wanted to be an artist, and he did have talent. Uh, his teachers uh, commented on his artistic ability. Mm. Although it's curious, he did landscapes and architecture pictures well, but when it came to putting a human face on or trying to do a portrait. Uh, he just didn't have it. He mm -hmm. just didn't have the warmth in his pictures that mm -hmm. you would need. And perhaps because of that, he was rejected twice by the Vienna Academy of Arts for lack of talent. Do you find that, you know, you, you kind of described, I think I, I'm, uh, uh, this is a question to you. It, you kind of described some of the things that I hear in a lot of uh, school shooters and things like that, the loner, uh, yes. the, the person who's isolated, you know, he, he has trouble, especially in a, adolescence. And, you know, there's some people with school shooters are like, yeah, we kind of knew that guy was kind of probably pop someday. Cause he was always alone. He was always, he always had trouble with the social skills, but the emotion thing is, is kind of interesting thing to me as well, because I, I, you know, we've had people on the show that are diagnosed, uh, a lot of school shooters and in a maleness being male, and being a male operating your emotions as a, as a feminine, as opposed to being logic, seems to be a play into a lot of school sh shooters and, and people that go through monstrosities. But I don't know. I'm asking you that. Is that is that a thing or is it not a thing? I'm not sure I can add much on school shooters. Um, mm -hmm. that it, it's curious that Adolf, even early on, showed a tremendous rage, which, again, was his father showed a lot of rage. So again, he picked up a lot of those characteristics that he really didn't like perhaps in his father, but yet continued to demonstrate those throughout his life. Yeah. The rage thing. That's always yeah. interesting. It, in it, in the uncontrollability of it and in the reaction of it, which is emotionalism on its, yeah. on its face too, yeah. very feminine. Um, it, the inability to control it. Uh, to not be stoic or have logic is interesting. So where does he go after he uh, does the artist thing? And, and what sort of cracks do you see in his behavioral? He really kicked around Vienna for a number of years. Uh, he was a vagabond. He had very little income. He was actually copying postcards and selling them to tourists for a period of time just to support himself. His mother died, and then his father died earlier. And so he was essentially an orphan. 
And he didn't do anything very productive until World War I broke out. And in 1914, he jumped at the opportunity to join a Bavarian regiment, the List Regiment, and he signed up and actually fought for four years in World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the army became like a, a family to him. Mm -hmm. Again, he was a loner. He wasn't particularly liked by his fellow troops, but he was brave. He ended up winning two Iron Crosses, one of which was Iron Cross First Class. So he was running uh, messages between the, uh, the, the rear up to where the troops were, which had to be dangerous work, and he fulfilled his job uh, well. He was respected for his bravery. There you go. Did he? Do you think he took any mental damage from the war, PTSD or anything like that? I don't know how he could have not done that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the trench warfare was so brutal, mm -hmm. and he spent four years, which was longer than most of the uh, troops e ever spent. And so you just wonder, stepping over dead bodies, uh, injured people, even though at the end of the day, he could go back to the rear and uh, sleep with, in some peace without being shot at. Yeah. I mean, that, that World War I was horrific. It was almost hand-to-hand -hand combat sort of thing and trench warfare, as you said. And it was just moving from one trench to another. And uh, it wasn't like the sort of wars we have nowadays where we you know, drop bombs on you with a drone. <laughs> Um, you talk in the book about how, I think this is something uh, people have always been interested in, uh, did Hitler have Jewish blood? It is. There's a question about his grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, Alois's father. Was he Jewish? And the historians are split on that, Chris. I, I tend to think the evidence may be slightly stronger that he did have a Jewish grandfather. But uh, it's uncertain. But at least Adolf was worried enough about it throughout his life that he launched several investigations. Hmm. So it probably affected his behavior, whether or not he had a, truly was, was Jewish or not. I don't know. It sounds like he was fascinated or intrigued by it, or maybe he was concerned about it or something. Very concerned about it. Very hmm. concerned. He developed uh, just, virulent anti-Semitism. Actually, when he was in Vienna, first time he had exposure to a large Jewish population. Hmm. And even when he was in Vienna, and certainly in Mein Kampf, he's just a virulent anti-Semitism comes through. That oh. possibly is because there were a lot of Jewish students and professors at the academy, mm -hmm. and he was rejected in favor of not only Jewish students, but other Austro-Hungarian immigrants that were coming in from the hinterlands into mm -hmm. Vienna. And he became very, very angry again, raged about that. Didn't think those people should be trained. Uh, they weren't German. They didn't speak German. The usual sort of tropes that uh, he developed. You know, it's interesting to me when people are loners, when they have trouble socially. Uh, I, I've seen this close by in, in incels. Um, they, they, they tend to take their self-loathing and turn it into some sort of external hate. And I'm no psychologist, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it, people who learn to hate and adopt hate of, of uh, another class of people or, or other people, um, there's a self-loathing, there's a self-hatred, there's a, there's a deficiency in them that they feel, and instead of, of uh, addressing it and dealing with it, they project it. Does that sound like a... I think you're absolutely right. I think he projection scapegoating was uh, very prominent in his yeah. life. His father scapegoated, by the way, as well. But Adolf Hitler did that throughout his life, even to the point where he fired some very capable people for mistakes that he had made, but yeah. that he blamed them for. Yeah. And of the course, anger. the whole anti- Go ahead, the, the anti semitism Of course, the whole anti-Semitism was, was the, that and his hatred for, for Slavic people. Wow. And so this starts about what age where he has this experience in Vienna? Uh, he would have, uh, that was in 1904, mm -hmm. uh, 1905 to 1914. So he spent about nine years in Vienna, pretty much as a vagabond, uh, working various odd jobs. Uh, there was one story where he was on a, 
outside platform and there was some some talk that his fellow worker is going to push him off of it. He really was most unpopular, probably because he liked to give lectures and he was um, highly verbal. Obviously, he was a great orator, became a great orator, but it made him very unpopular when he just would spout off these long sermons, hmm. political topics, mainly. Mm -hmm. The uh, you talk in the book about Hitler's sexuality. And uh, tell us a little bit about that, because it's interesting how a man deals with that in the past he takes. Yeah, we did put a chapter in there on his sexuality, uh, trying to identify what was real and what might have been misinformation mm -hmm. that was fed by the Allies. I think the biggest thing I'd say about Adolf Hitler was he was fairly asexual. Hmm. There was some suggestion he might be homosexual, mm. probably better evidence that he was heterosexual, and he did probably have a, a number of women, gr girlfriends throughout his life, but not an overwhelming number. He mm. was very uncertain about that, whether or not it was his charisma or whether or not simply his office that attracted women. But he turned out to be a very poor choice for a boyfriend. Most of these women ended up committing suicide or attempting suicide. Jesus. So that's never a good sign. If that's not a good sign, <laughs> not very supportive. Um, let me ask you this. Did he have, uh, did it take him a while to get into relationships with women? Like a lot of these loners and people who we see nowadays that have problems very early on in like high school, you know, they don't have girlfriends. They, they have trouble. They don't really kind of get into the whole sexuality and girlfriends until later in life. And, and even then, they're not well-liked because no one else likes them in it either. Yeah, it did seem to take him a while. Uh, mm. He didn't have any girlfriends growing up to speak of or in Vienna that we're aware of. Um, then he had a relationship with his second cousin, put her up in an apartment when he was now in politics. And um, perhaps other than his mother, the only other woman he really loved. And she... Uh, committed suicide or else there were some rumors that perhaps he had had her killed. Wow. Perhaps because she had gone out and with a Jewish man. So yeah, there. the fear of loss, right? You, you find love and the, and the fear of loss. I mean, like Jeffrey Dahmer sort of thing uh, where uh, you know, you, you find love and then you, you know, it, I, I've seen that with like, you know, a mother abandonment or father abandoned with children. They have a hard time if they get into relationships and that person leaves them, you know, they struggle with it. Very interesting in the psychology of it, you know, and, and most people, I think, you know, they, they get into relationships with the opposite sex or, you know, whatever their uh, proclivities are for the other. And, and, you know, they develop those early on and, and they start learning behaviors of, of, hopefully they're healthy and, and, uh, you know, getting along with the, the opposite sex or the other person. And, uh, it's, it's just to me, like you see a lot of school shooters and stuff. They don't do that in high schools. They're, they're loners and they, they don't, they don't have girlfriends. They don't have, they, they've kind of just, they've never, they're struggling to, I, I guess, adjust socially when it comes down to it. Yes. I think that's true. He had a hard time dealing with women. He, he could be, charming in a small social setting, mm -hmm. but um, he really didn't, he, he was a misogynist. Mm. He, he really didn't think that women should be in politics. The reason he liked Ava Braun was she was pretty empty headed and he mm. could just completely forget about the politics. There you go. You know, and that played, well, I, I don't want to assume this because you've done the research. My understanding is, uh, you know, when the Nazis came to power, this whole familial thing, misogynist sort of nature, they were, you know, they really promoted the family sort of element. There was this whole pushback to traditional family values and having a wife and kids and stuff. I was watching a documentary on this recently. Um, it, 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 did that play into his misogyny or his, his anger at women? Uh, maybe because he, he picked so many girlfriends. You know, one of the problems with having childhood issues is you pick bad people um, that aren't that aren't healthy in their minds either. You know, especially if his girlfriends are committing suicide, it's probably a sign that he's a bad picker. 
of people or he picks people who are a mirror of his his psychological problems but that did that play maybe into am i correct there that the nazis they they kind of i my understanding is they went against sort of feminism and they went against nazi very, or the, uh very, homosexuality very so. and lgbtq stuff yeah very much so uh, yeah. they were very misogynistic that's one of the things he liked they were very anti-semitic of course he liked that as well uh, they were very pan germany greater mm. germany he became a nationalist after uh, uh world war one and so when they were very much against the uh, treaty of paris that uh, caused germany to owe five billion dollars and so they the party that he initially spied on for the weimar government had that as its platform and those were all features that were very appealing to him mm -hmm. uh, and very misogynistic again there were no women uh, within the party with any sort of uh, responsibility yeah i saw this um uh documentary recently i don't know how i tripped into it but uh it was one of those they talked about how the nazis you know, started promoting the national sort of image and how everyone should have kids and babies. And, and, uh, they actually were doing some sort of baby making or baby having promotions sort of thing. Yes. Going on. And so it was like, it was like, Hey, let's breathe the nation back to, to whatever. Um, yeah. that and was then, part of his eugenics uh, thing. He, they yeah. felt as if they had lost the cream of the crop in world war one and so order to fill in, they, strongly encouraged the, the women to have lots and lots of babies and of course that get, even gave rise to the Lebensborn movement in World War II where the SS troops were uh, trying to, to breed as many young Nazis as they possibly could and then to put those babies into the homes of uh, Hitler supporters to raise. So it was eugenics movement was was very large. Hitler was very much in support of eugenics. Yeah and I'm and my understanding is he got that from us right? <laughs> Henry Ford he and Henry Ford he and uh, Charles Lindbergh, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's a, I was I read the book cast, and I recommend people read it. And it's it's really interesting how uh, we're, we we seem to be at the beginning of so many crises that we cause. Um, it, it, it's very interesting, and you talk about um, syphilis, heart disease, and Parkinson's. Let's uh, talk about some of that. When did that uh, start to come together, and maybe have an effect on his mental health? The, the syphilis story is particularly interesting, but and we go into it at some length, but I honestly, in the book, debunk syphilis in Hitler. Mm. Uh, his neurological findings were not those of someone with syphilis. Uh, there's a particular variety of the most severe form, general paresis of the insane is the old term for it, and he simply did not have the neurological signs for that. Mm -hmm. He certainly did have coronary artery disease, heart disease, uh, that occurred when he was still in his 40s. And when wow. he was at the Berghof, he would like to climb up from his Berghof residence up about 1,500 feet to the uh, house that was there. And he would get this crushing chest pain. Mm -hmm. And there are several examples of him suffering what almost certainly is angina. We don't recognize it as angina. And so he knew something was wrong. Uh, and he was a fairly young man at that point, as I say, in his late 40s. His Parkinson's disease also came on when he was in his 40s, probably uh, about 1933, 1934, were his first sign of uh, Parkinson's disease. And these times are important because even though there was no treatment for coronary artery disease at the time, or no treatment really for Parkinson's disease, this was pre-L-DOPA era, mm -hmm. uh, so that people would live only eight to 10 years, typically with a diagnosis of either heart disease or Parkinson's disease. I think that's relevant later on as to why he attacked the Soviet Union in 1941 rather than delay it until they were better prepared for war. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, there's a famous movie. I don't know if you've seen the meme where Hitler's shaking with his glasses uh, as he's taking them off. And I, I, I've always had the perception that it was rage. Maybe the portrayal is that he had Parkinson's. Did he? Did he have any of this sort of experience of 
of Parkinson's with the shaking and stuff eventually? Oh, very much so. Yes. It, oh, it wow. began initially in his left hand. Mm -hmm. Not shortly thereafter, went to the right side. He was very tremulous in his hands, mm -hmm. became very slow, mm -hmm. uh, became stooped. His facial expression went rather blank. Mm -hmm. And so there are some videos, particularly later in World War II, when the censorship was breaking down and a few videos slipped out of his Parkinsonism, wow. which I think it's been known for decades that he had Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So what was he aware of that diagnosis or was he just pushing he, through it and not aware? He eventually was told the diagnosis very late in the game. Uh, his mm. uh, doctor, Theodore Morell, documented in his case history his Parkinson's disease. And I actually started him on some medicine that may have helped his tremor somewhat. Yeah. And then he was he self-medicating that? Was that the reason? I believe he was into speed or meth or there was something, you know, stuff he was taking, I think, at the end of his. He, he was. There were a number of medicines. He was on cocaine, methamphetamine, certainly various barbiturates. So he was uh, taking a host of medicine. There were some 80 medicines that he was had taken over a period of years, most by Theodore Morell. There you go. That sounds like Fridays at my house. No, I'm just kidding. Folks. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do drugs. This is jokes. These are comedy. So we do on the show. Um, <laughs> Don't don't do anything. Just just lead a healthy life and eat salads. Um, you know, and that was interesting because I think he got pretty deep into it, where he was pretty much operating on drugs all the time, wasn't he? He was. Um, mm -hmm. Morel was abetting this. He was shooting him up with methamphetamine, and then at night when he came down, he took the the barbs to slow him up. Wow. Uh, there were times when he was just almost immobile. And Morel would show up with his hypodermic and give him a shot. And miraculously, he would wake up and uh, become very animated again. So he became very dependent on Theodore Morel, probably why he kept him around. Morel was very poorly thought of as a physician. Wow. He really didn't have any specialty, any special training. Um, he was seen as a venereal disease doctor and was brought there for other reasons for a friend of Adolf Hitler's, uh, Hoffman, his uh, uh, photographer, but they hit up, uh, became friends, and I'm sure they had something to talk about having both served in World War One, and so he became his trusted medical advisor. So it appears that he, he kind of starts having a stack of stuff. You've got PTSD, you've got childhood trauma, you've got relationship issues, you're mixing cocaine and meth and God knows what, and then you've got Parkinson's disease on top of that. That sounds like a combo for a lot of fun on a Friday night. <laughs> I am convinced, Chris, that his poor health uh, impacted his performance, especially yeah. later in the war when things were going so badly and he was getting worse in terms of his Parkinson's disease and his heart disease and the medicines were increasing drastically. This had to have affected his behavior and his performance. Mercifully, it affected, it made his performance much worse. Yeah. And the whole... I mean, I imagine the the horror of the monster of him wanting to exterminate Jews and everything else. I mean, I imagine a lot of this played into that. You, you would you would think so, yes. Uh, yeah. And yet he seemed pretty much unfazed by his brutality. Wow. Uh, I think he was um, psychopathic in that regard. Uh, he just sociopathic, just did not have good feelings for the empathy uh, understanding of other people's hurts. Is there a lot of uh, psychopathy uh, that you find, you know, we see this in criminals a lot, uh, you know, their, their attitudes towards other human beings and their dismissal of seeing other people as human, uh, you know, sometimes the victimization themselves. Uh, a lot of that we see from childhood trauma and different issues in childhood, uh, to me, I believe, emotionally, too. Um is that is that something we see in a lot of criminals and, and the childhood trauma that comes from them? Yes, the, the psychopaths, sociopaths, uh, very common among criminals. They hmm. just don't seem to react in the same way as people who have a have a conscience. Is there a connection to how they're raised and 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 the experience they have as children? There has been a lot written about that. Uh, I probably should defer to a psychiatrist 
there you <laughs> go. than a behavioral neurologist on that. I'll ask my psychiatrist when he sees me later today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there you go. What have we touched on that you'd like people to know about the book that we can tease out some more? Well, I think an interesting uh, question has always been asked by the historians, why did Germany break the 1939 non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and attack in, in June of 1941? And there are some arguments that, well, maybe the Soviet Union was particularly vulnerable because, after all, Stalin had purged the officers' corps. Yes, that's true. And Germany was finding getting the raw the resources they needed from the Soviet Union somewhat more difficult. And the U.S. was beginning to rearm and were supplying Great Britain. I think, on the other hand, though, when you look at how Germany was prepared, they didn't even have a full complement of conventional weapons. The wonder weapons, which they eventually developed, they didn't have in 1941. Uh, the V-1, V-2 rockets, the sound-activated torpedoes, the, the jet bombers, jet planes. These were clearly superior to anything the Allies had. So the question is, what if he waited three, four years before he attacked? Clearly, that was his plan. Mm -hmm. That's where he was going to have his Lebensraum for the greater German nation. But I think, Chris, it's at least in part because his health became a, uh, it demanded that he attack early. Had he waited mm -hmm. till, say, mid-1940s, he wouldn't have survived in all likelihood. Uh, he, he could find out his life expectancy with heart disease and Parkinson's disease. The German doctors knew that even though they couldn't affect it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think that was a factor, a medical imperative, that he start the war, war early. Of course, he was such a megalomaniac, he didn't think anyone else could lead the war except himself. Yeah. And if he was able to win the war, then people after him could, uh, could carry on. And there's a lot of lessons in the attack uh, that he did, that he launched on the Soviets. I mean, yes. the timing was horrific. Uh, you know, uh, the Soviets didn't have the proper coats to even go fight in a Soviet winter. Uh, and then a, trying to fight in a Soviet winter. I mean, I'm in Utah right now. I don't go outside during winter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, and so that ended up being a, a huge uh, mistake. And then fighting two fronts, you know, that's a, that's a great lesson in war. Um, having two fronts instead of one, uh, you know, fighting for both sides and depleting your resources uh, to, to go uh, from two ways. Um, you know, very interesting that way. Let me ask you this, because you, you said a very interesting thing about how maybe he knew that his time was limited be, or, you know, maybe his Parkinson's would excel to a point that, you know, he would become... Uh, you know, uh, uh, shaking and having trouble with motor skills and things, or uh, sometimes, I don't know, maybe you feel like your mind is closing on you uh, and you feel trapped. Um, there's kind of, would that parallel, I don't know, I don't know how much you study what's going on with Putin, but there's rumors of him having maybe Parkinson's, maybe having cancer, maybe him taking drugs to fight off some sort of malady. He's certainly in his 70s, which many men you know, start to decline heavily in their health in their 70s. Um, and that megalomaniac connection of trying to make that final dent in the world. You know, there's people have talked about how he has this Peter the Great accession and, you know, going out with one last big blast or something, some, some sort of weird sort of make your mark on the world, a maniacal sort of thing. Like these fuckers are going to remember you no matter what. I don't know. Well, I think certainly that was the case for Adolf Hitler, that he uh, rushed into the war mm -hmm. because of the medical imperative. And even when he started the war, he and his generals disagreed about it. Uh, Adolf Hitler had a strategy which actually might have worked had he stuck with it. There was mm -hmm. going to be the northern front and the southern front. And he was going to encircle the armies and he was going to get the breadbasket in Ukraine and go down and get the oil fields, the fuel, and starve out Moscow. Mm -hmm. But his generals wanted to, on Clausewitz strategy, go take the enemy's capital. Mm -hmm. And so, uncharacteristically, Adolf Hitler compromised 
with with all three objectives, Leningrad was one that he was also going to do along with the southern attack. And he compromised, but interestingly enough, he had told his closest advisor he was going to cancel that attack on Moscow and just go with the northern and the southern. That something happened then in August and September that took him out of the planning room. He developed uh, two acute gastrointestinal illnesses. The first one was probably a bacterial dysentery, mm -hmm. which really laid him low. Uh, he had uh, irritable bowel syndrome his whole life. Maybe he, he, that made it worse, but it took him out for about a month. As he was recovering from that, then he appeared to have a gallbladder attack that took him out for another month. As mm -hmm. a result, he didn't cancel that third attack on Moscow, clearly overstretching his army and um, so I think his GI illnesses, even though they were fairly brief, uh, had a, had an impact on that uh, that campaign, major yeah. impact. Maybe you want to play catch up, or uh, maybe you you know interesting. You know, it, you, it, there's a parallel there to the Russian, uh, the Ukraine invasion, where they tried to cut the head off and take the capital. And they stretched their their uh, their things too far and and underestimated uh, yes. horribly what happened. And uh, you know I think everyone everyone around the world anticipated that they would be able to pull that off within three days, three to five days. And the failure of that has uh, has had an impact on the war and how we strategize it. So it's interesting those those similar perils that you have there. It really is. There are a lot of parallels there. Yeah, a lot of I, I love strategy and war and and trying to understand things. But I think the picture that you paint that's so great in the book is, you know, a lot of people study the strategy of of the of the of the, of the military and the war with Hitler. But you know, you once you merge that with his maladies and his psychological things and the drugs and the other things that are happening to him, you know, that paints a, a much bigger picture and in, into into the cause and effect of it all. Well, thank you, Chris. That's what I was really trying to do is uh, his medical problems really haven't gotten that much attention. There have been some books written, but mostly they're rather turgid volumes, not accessible by uh, the, the usual reader. And so I was going to I wanted to try to put this in language that was understandable while putting in the history. There's a lot of history there. And I think together it tells a broader story and it it helps to make more sense of it. Yeah, it definitely does to give a broader picture. Anything more you'd like to tease out on the book before we go? O only one thing, uh, Chris, if I, if I may. Please. Historians have been afraid to even talk about his illnesses for fear that this would somehow reduce his culpability. I don't think there's any reason in the world that it would reduce his culpability. His anti-Semitism, his grandiosity, his cruelty, all of these were characteristics that were developed decades before he became physically ill. Mm -hmm. I think his illnesses impacted his performance, but they didn't cause his cruelty or his anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So I would just like to make sure that no one leaves this thinking that this in any way reduces his uh, culpability for his his evil yeah. that he foisted upon the world there you go uh you know it's it to, to me when when human beings fail i mean there's a lot of different factors a lot of different switches maybe they get flipped i'm not sure switches the right analogies but yeah there's uh, it, it's important for us to study these people so that somehow we can maybe find out you know where they turned wrong you know, I, I love collecting stories and learning life lessons and, and interesting on people as to how they go through this pathway or this forest of life and they choose one path or another and it each way they go down takes them through uh, some sort of something that might turn horrific or something that might turn beautiful or something that, you know, you never know. I and mean, that's kind of the way it is. But there certainly seems to be a series of failures that take place that, that create these monsters and certainly we like not to have as many monsters running around this world anymore if we could. 
Absolutely. At least that's my policy. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Let's get rid of the monsters and try and all be better human beings. Uh, so thank you very much for coming on the show, Tom. I really love this stuff. I think people really are intrigued by it. And uh, hopefully we can all just uh, build a better world from the knowledge we can learn from it. Well, Chris, thank you so much for asking me to come on the show. You are the best. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And you've uh, certainly appealed to my narcissism. Uh <laughs> Flatter will get you everywhere, sir. Uh, Tom, give me your dot com so that people can find you on the interwebs, please. Yes, it's TomHuttonMD.com. There you go. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, so much for tuning in. You guys are the most brilliant audience in the world. See how I played that into that? Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to prove their narcissism as well. It's like, I oh, listen to the Chris Voss Show. Buy your shirts online or whatever. I don't know. There aren't shirts online. Anyway, guys, uh, go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Any place you see us on the interwebs. Or if the book where fine books are sold, Hitler's Maladies and Their Impact on World War II, a Behavioral neurologics neural neurologists neurologist <laughs> neurologist you know it's the behavioral part that screws me up behavioral neurologist view available february 28th 2023 wherever fine books are sold learn about this stuff history is always uh, done and you probably have a special on the history channel they love hitler over i mean they don't love hitler but they like playing stuff about him and i think that's what intrigues so many people is is uh, trying to figure out you know what what the hell went wrong so there you go uh, thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. And that should have us out, Tom.